Hello and welcome to VOA's Red Carpet. I'm your host, Sunday Shomari. On this episode of Red Carpet, we have award-winning photos exploring Mozambique's colonial past and art flourishing amid a political crisis in Niger. Let's get on with the show. We begin with highlights of the latest entertainment news around the world. In film news, Ghana is set to host the first ever summit on African cinema in November in collaboration with Film One Group and Silverbird Cinema, two of the leading cinema operators in Nigeria and Ghana. The summit aims to showcase the potential and opportunities of cinema in Africa, as well as foster partnerships and collaborations among industry players. The gathering will feature screenings, panel discussions, keynote speeches, and networking sessions. In some sad music news, Clarence Avant, a music industry mogul and former chairman of Motown Records, has died at the age of 92 in Los Angeles, according to a statement released by his family to U.S. media. Avant, who was known as the godfather of black music, had influenced beyond music and acted as an advisor to several U.S. presidents, including Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama. Now to art news. In Niger's capital, Niamey, artists are contributing to the narrative around a military coup that has shaken the stability of not only the country, but the wider region. Let's take a look. At a makeshift roadside studio in Niger's capital Niamey, Bubakar Jibo's brush brings a landscape of undulating sand dunes to life. The message of this canvas is ominous. Missiles reflect the threat of military intervention to reverse a coup last month. The darkness, symbolic of sanctions and their effect on electricity supplies. I see that the whole of Africa is rising up today to really fight neo-colonialism and have independence, total freedom in our nations. So this has inspired me a lot, and I express myself through my work. In Niamey, artists are exploring ways to engage with a political crisis that threatens the stability of not only their country, but the wider region. Military officers deposed President Mohamed Bazoum on July 26th. They have defied calls to reinstate him from the United Nations and West African bloc ECOWAS. The latter has said it is ready to intervene militarily as a last resort. But in the capital, many residents were deeply disillusioned with Bazoum's government and are supportive of the coup. That's also evident among some creatives like Isifu Umaru, also known as Fino. At a studio in the capital, he and other rappers record lyrics on resilience, nationalism and change. The population has demonstrated by A plus B that it supports military action in our country. So no international community has the right, the duty or even the mandate to say that we don't know what we want. Elsewhere, Hamid Guisa was putting the final touches to his painting. He says his country is in a fragile state, with people inciting hatred and division. His artwork is a message of hope. I dream of a Niger that is united, he says, not by its political parties, but by the love of the country, by the love of Niger. Tunisian artist Zuhair El Bakhri is carving out a unique artistic world for himself, where he welds scrap, factory remains, and discarded industrial material into works of art. Let's take a look. I collect scraps from the garbage, the sea, and on the road, from everywhere. I gather all sorts of scrap and use them to create beautiful art sculptures. This Tunisian artist has turned discarded industrial materials into work of art. Zuhair El Bakri collects factory remains and scrap metal and wields them into sculptures that he says 
reflect emotions. All these sculptures tell stories of people, joy, sadness, those who have been released from prison, those who have gone through a divorce, and much more. Everything belongs to people, and these stories remain and live with me. Inside his small workshop in Tunis, accompanied by his hammer and other tools, is where Bakri creates his own world. There he begins and ends his day, which he describes as filled with events and stories that he portrays through his artistic touch and shapes with his own two hands. When I take part in group exhibitions, I hear them say, look, the illiterate has arrived. How can he create all these sculptures while being illiterate? Once I attended an exhibition in a company about a month ago. The company's owner asked me how I create these sculptures. He said, I can't believe it's really you. The person who creates these sculptures must be an engineer, and that there's someone who is drawing for me, and another one who plans everything, and that I'm only responsible for the welding. I felt goosebumps and my tears came down, and I laughed because I couldn't respond to evil with more evil. El Bakri has turned his profession into his source of income. He says he collects scraps and iron remnants to sculpt stories from reality, symbolizing joy, sorrow, desire, and deprivation in their various forms. The young artist hopes that his work will gain recognition outside Tunisia among art enthusiasts. In more art news, Shannon Hall is a small business owner who teaches local calligraphy workshops and designs a stationery in the Washington DC area. With a decline in public attention to handwriting, Hall tells us about her passion for calligraphy and says it is not a forgotten art form. So this is a calligraphy nib and this is a pen holder. So usually before I start, I always pick a nib and um, put it into my pen holder to get ready to start writing. So these are the envelopes that will hold the calligraphy nibs for my students. Um, so on each one, I'll just write nibs. My name is Shannon Ho. I am a small business owner of a business called Peach and Papery. I teach calligraphy workshops and design stationery um, for the Washington, D.C. area. I just feel like it's important to be able to not necessarily, necessarily write cursive, but be able to like sign your name. And I know a lot of kids nowadays, like they can't read cursive or sign their names because they just don't understand the um, idea of connecting your letters. And, you know, they're so used to working on a laptop um, at school that it's kind of become foreign to write. I host classes all over the area. Most of the places I would go to are to bars or wineries or restaurants. Right now I'm setting up for class. Um, I am putting out some of the supplies that our guests are gonna be working with. And that is it for the ink. <laughs> I typically reach out to small businesses in the area. Um, me being a small business owner and Sip and Script being a small business, we felt that it was really important to work with other small businesses in our local areas to support them and help bring traffic to them if they need it on like a slow night. Um, so usually I would reach out to them and see if they would be interested in a calligraphy workshop where people would come to learn calligraphy and they could also order drinks um, and food to enjoy on the side. So it's kind of like a win-win for both parties. What's your name? Oh, you guys are all together, right? Yes. Yeah, feel free to grab your name uh, cards. Okay, great. This is a beginner's crash course to modern calligraphy. Learning calligraphy, well, I think it's useful because um, you can use it for cards or labeling, but above that, it's just something artistic and creative you get to do. Um, I took classes when I was in high school, but I forgot, kind of, so that's why I want a refresh because I miss doing it and yeah so that's why I was interested. Um, I've always wanted to do calligraphy. Um, I usually see, I've seen like YouTube tutorials um, but I really want to just go in person and finally do it for once and I'm lucky enough that I managed to get like the last spot in the class. So. 
And the key is really to take your time and go slowly. If you end up going too fast, you're gonna get shaky lines. So really take your time with each stroke. Um, so over time, when you get more comfortable, you can kind of infuse your personality and style into it. And that's what really makes modern calligraphy so fun and unique. I don't think I have great handwriting, so I was very nervous about coming, but I'm glad that I did. I'll definitely go home and practice again. Mozambican photographer Yasmin Folte, whose contemporary artwork gained her a contemporary African photography CAP prize, is using the win to highlight the country's colonial past through her family history. Here's more. This award-winning Mozambican photographer highlights the country's colonial past through her family's story. Yasmin Forte aims to dissect the effects of colonialism and migration on Africans. Her work, entitled This is a Story About My Family, uses collage to juxtapose the past and present. Porque dentro da história o que que eu tento fazer? Eu tento, eu tento não, eu conto a história que é do do meu pai. In this work, I tell a story about my father, a Portuguese soldier that came to Mozambique with his mom and dad and lived here many years and went to the army. That's why we have the picture of him in a military suit. He lived in town. That's why we have the buildings on his face. And my mom born in Kalamani in a simple home made with clay and who later on moved to a big house. Não sei se sabes o que é que é, e que depois foi uma casa, foi para uma outra casa maior. Então, o que eu tento fazer? So, what I try to do is cross these stories to join these two stories. It's my storytelling using the pictures I glued together. I combined the past and the present. E o presente. The project gained her a contemporary African photography CAP prize. It's the recognition, it's the doors that open, and in the world of photography, I think that the eyes will be open for the work that I do. It's an excellent moment that I have to show my work and to show the world what I do. Now for an update on African sports, VOAs, the one and only Kali Abdu has this roundup. Here's your latest African sports headlines in 60 seconds. Gudaev Sagai led a clean sweep for Ethiopia in the women's 10,000 meters final at the World Athletics Championship in Budapest, Hungary on Saturday, August the 19th. That's after a dramatic 10,000 meters in which race leader Stefan Hassan of the Netherlands stumbled and fell just meters short of the finish line. In the men's race on Sunday, August the 20th, Uganda's Joshua Cheptegei won his third successive World Championship 10,000 meters gold despite an injury hit year. Also in Budapest, Botswana's Letzile Tobogo became the first African to win a 100-meter medal at the World Championships. He took silver by 1,000 of a second ahead of the UK's Darnell Hughes. The gold went to Noah Lyles of the US. And in rugby, a dominant performance by South Africa saw them defeat Wales 52-16 on Saturday in a preparatory match for the Rugby World Cup. However, coach Jackson and Neighbor said there was room for much improvement ahead of the Springboks opening fixture in France on September the 10th. Thanks for watching VOA's Red Carpet. I'm your host, Sunday Shumari. For more of your entertainment news, please check us out on www.voaafrica.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye, everyone.